Um, yes, so let's get started. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the uh, finite bit neural networks from the landscape point of view today. And this is, uh, the talk is mostly based on our ICML paper from 2021, but I will also present some material from my thesis, um, well, um, and some more numerics that we, uh, that we put up uh, recently. And this is joint work with uh, Francois, Flavio, Francesco, Arthur, and my supervisors, Clemon and Wolfram, and also Johannes. So I want to first start with some motivation uh, for finite width neural networks. So here I'm pulling some empirical results from a Behnam Nation Burr's um, paper from 2017. So here's a classic shell of neural network that is trained on the Amnes data set. And here, like a 32 neural network fits, um, hits a zero training error. And with further over parameterization, we see the test error is decreasing and it saturates around like with uh, 128 or so. And the similar trends carry over for other data sets like uh, CIFAR and SVHN. Um, what, I'm, what I'm seeing in this plot is that like the further the, the over parameterization is, like the generalization error does not like gradually decrease, but it first decreases at the onset of over parameterization and then it saturates. And in this talk, I'm trying, I'm gonna try to understand like what is going on at the onset of, of over parameterization and, uh, and also further on, but in particular this behavior, like what, what makes over parameterization, um, what makes it good for the generalization error. Um, and this is a, now a known fact, I think, that over parameterization help, helps with training. Uh, as we saw in the first slide, but I want to show here a toy example. So here's a target function with two uh, generated by two hyperplanes, uh, and we can pick the hyperplanes in different like orientations. So that generates another target function, and we can generate more like tasks of this sort. And then we can train a two neural uh, student network. So here each row represents a different sampling of the hyperplanes. So it's a different data set, and we are training 20 seeds of students. And here the dark brown indicates a zero loss solution. So the loss is 10 to the minus 16 in that case. And the yellow dot is a, um, is a high loss, basically. So we see in some fractions, like the gradient flow converges to the zero loss solution, but in some other seats, it fails to find a solution, even in this very simple problem. So this is the zero over parameterization case. And if we keep over parameterizing further, uh, we see that the number of uh, dark blue dots increase. So there is, a, there is this reliable convergence already at factor two uh, for this simple problem. Uh, sorry, factor four, I want to say. Already at factor two, like there's a lot of dark blue dots, but at factor two, it's almost completely uh, dark blue. So it's almost, a, all, every seed converges to zero loss. And similarly, uh, if we arrange like similar, a similar problem generated by four hyperplanes, uh, then we see in the zero over parameterization case, uh, for some teachers, turned out to be uh, the problem turned out to be quite difficult actually because uh, the last uh, half of the rows uh, we see no uh, no cases of success, so it's all yellow dots. So it's a very non-convex problem. And in particular, uh, I'm going to try to answer these questions. I mean, give a, give an answer to these questions actually in this talk. So why is it hard to train without overparameterization? And what is the benefit of over parameterization? So the go-to answer, I think, is like, yeah, there's a fixed number of uh, data points, and if we over parameterize further, there are more solutions, so we can find smoother interpolators. So that's a benefit of over parameterization. But I will give an answer from a landscape point of view to this question. Uh, and this is the big question: like, how much over parameterization do we need uh, to prove convergence to a zero-loss solution in, in finite with scenarios? And I'm uh, by no means I'm going to give a like a com com complete answer to this question. This is very problem uh, specific, and I think it's a very difficult question. Like even to study in a, in a, in your favorite problem of choice in a shallow shallow neural network setting, but I will give an average case uh, answer to this question that one can keep in mind when choosing a problem. Um, and this is my final motivation slide. And uh, yeah, uh, the analysis gives also a perspective on this uh, recent work. So um, that is over-parameterized over solutions are equivalent up to uh, permutations. 
Um, and here we are looking at a picture from Antazari. Um, so there, like, there's these basins uh, that are identical to each other of the permutations. So each uh, each of these solutions are identical, and uh, uh, and also recent work on the Gitri basin, they uh, come up with a similar argument, like they can't find a good permutation to map solutions to each other that are in turn like linearly mode connected, and uh, they attribute to this uh, to this to implicit regularization of stochastic gradient descent. But uh, we will see in our model like that all solutions are identical to each other, and SGD sometimes, if the network is wide enough, SGD finds them. So they are like, they, they are naturally linearly mode connected in this regime. And uh, so this is, uh, this is, and uh, yeah, with, 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 with the characterization of the global minimum manifold, we are like, we are able to see that their solutions are connected, but also we know more about the structure of the solutions. Like we know the exact parameters of the solutions, and uh, not only the functional form, but how, how, what should each neuron do, basically. And using this uh, formalization, we can prune, prune wide neural networks. And here we are seeing, like, on the, so this is an amnesty experiment. Uh, and we are generating a teacher network that has 30 neurons in uh, three hidden layers. And it reaches a high, high loss uh, level. This is uh, represented by the orange dots on the left. And then we are over-parameterizing a neural network by a factor of three. And then, like, okay, like with overparameterization, um, we are finding better solutions that are shown by the purple dots. And then we can prune them down to the original network size. So that gives a solution of the original non convex problem. Um, that's uh, one way to solve it. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the neural uh, landscapes of neural, ne neural ne networks, but I want to. I will talk about it from the symmetry point of view. And uh, so there are already like a lot of example loss landscapes with full of symmetries. So for example, dictionary learning, clustering, tensor decomposition, and also in Risa's talk, like we see a simplest case of symmetry, a subtle point between uh, the two solutions. Um, and there are like broader classes of uh, symmetries for loss landscapes. Like here in the first picture, there's a rotational symmetry for the global minimum or discrete symmetries, which is the case we are uh, going to be studying. And uh, yeah, there's a, there are also like more like a, a, a more versions of it. So this is a line of critical points on the third picture. And I'm, I'm going to talk this a little bit more in detail. So there are the symmetries and the, there is the complexity for neural networks. And so this uh, complexity analysis is uh, was done for spherical spin glasses and uh, more uh, models. So uh, the, the, the relevant thing to do in this analysis is to count the number of critical points, because then it gives an idea about how difficult this problem is and how non-convex non it is um, in some ways. So we are going to take this approach to study neural networks, and we are going to count the number of critical manifolds. So neural networks are symmetries. So it's not going to be the number of critical points in this case, because the because um, the critical points form manifolds due to symmetries, so we are supposed to count the number of the uh, manifolds. Um, so I'm going to do it in six steps. Uh, first, uh, yeah, I, I'll introduce the symmetry approach to landscape complexity. Then I'll, I'll present the scaling laws, so that's the number of critical manifolds. Uh, and then I will, I will look at one such manifold and actually, even like one such manifold is, uh, it, it shows like quite a non-trivial behavior. So it's, uh, there is on the same line, all critical points achieve the same loss, but some part of it is the saddle points, full of saddle points, and the other part um, has local minimum. <laughs> so we will, we will look at these transitions from a static point of view. Um, and I'll introduce uh, the landscape complexity measure and then uh, the equivalence class of global minimum and yeah. If time permits, I'll, I'll have a look at this pruning uh, application in the last slide. Okay. So uh, here I'm taking a shallow neural network um, that is generated by n neurons. So wj is the incoming vector, and aj is the outgoing weight. And theta is the parameter vector. So it's a concatenation of all the vectors of the, of the neurons. And uh, so I'm going to use these cartoons for my counting arguments. So here's a width and neural network. And um, each neuron is represented by a color. So when I refer to a, color, a neuron, 
I mean, a concatenation of the incoming vector W1 and um, the outgoing rate A1. Uh, and I'm, I'm picking a loss function. Um, so I'm uh, defining a cost, C, uh, and any um, target function that is F star. So cost uh, C, C measures the difference, and I'm averaging over an input data that is P, denoted by P. It could be discrete or it could be continuous. So at this stage, it could be an ERM or it could be the population loss. And uh, I'm assuming C and sigma are twice differentiable and that the cost function is zero if and only if the prediction and the target match. So this is uh, gonna be the all assumptions that I'm using. Um, so the first principle is the neuron splitting. So if we, if we take one of the neurons, the green neuron, let's say, I'm sitting in two pieces, that is copy the incoming vector, W1, and split the outgoing weight into two pieces by a factor mu, so mu times A1 is the one outgoing connection, and one minus mu times A1 the other. So the sum of the two neurons is the same as the original network function. This is um, rather trivial, but it was observed uh, by Fukumizi and Amari in 2000. That if the first configuration is a critical point, then the second configuration is also a critical point of the loss landscape. So this comes from a simple gradient calculation. Um, so this is known. And then there is another similar principle, that is the zero neuron addition. So we can add two neurons to this expanded network. Um, so the incoming vector is W prime, that can be anything. An outgoing weight is A prime and minus A prime. So if we sum them together, it is a zero neuron. It doesn't add anything to the function, it doesn't change the network function. Okay. Uh, so this doesn't preserve the criticality, but it, it preserves the network function because the neurons cancel out each other. And hi, here I am showing a group of two uh, zero neurons, but it could be a group of five or one group of two and another group of three, and this is gonna factor in, in our like uh, uh, computations of the number of manifolds. So there are two symmetry principles that I'm gonna study. And with that, now I can already introduce the scaling law. Um, and here I, I'm putting an extra assumption that is the, the for on the data set, that the data set is generated by a finite width neural network. That is, a, let's say, a width k neural network. Um, so already with a width k network, the neural network, uh, the data set can be interpolated by a neural network. So this is also known as a teacher assumption, but I wanna say this is a like structured teacher. So it, it is a teacher that fits the data set perfectly, and k can be as large as we want, but it is finite, that's the assumption. Um, so in this, uh, now I can introduce also what I mean by over parameterization and under parameterization. Under parameterization. So there's the Witt-K neural network, and the smaller neural networks are under parameterized, and bigger ones are over parameterized. Okay, so I'm I'm picking an under parameterized network of Witt and now. And uh, uh, and here I'm showing you an irreducible parameter. Um, that is a the network function generated by these four neurons cannot be represented with a smaller number of neurons. So that is to say there is no splitted neurons inside of this configuration, so I couldn't merge them together. It's, it, all neurons are distinct from each other, that's why I'm using different colors in this cartoon. Okay. So, and then with neuron splitting, um, so yeah, here uh, the green neuron is splitted for three times and orange is splitted two times, and I'm ending up in this configuration. Uh, that I'm also showing in the in the bucket, and uh, okay, so yeah, let me let me just write get into it. So what I what do I mean by scaling law? Is uh, the number of manifolds that are generated by this width n parameter in the width m neural network? Okay, so we are looking at the lands loss landscape of this wider neural network of width m neural network, and the question. Um, and the thing is we have n neurons to start with, but we wanna fill n positions with these n neurons. So how can we do it? It's, it's, an, it's a, an actually a, um, a, a partition problem. Like let's look at the first, sec first the second formula. So for each partition that I'm denoting by k1 to kn, um, so there is a number of per permutations inside the wider network. So that is uh, denoted by this mul multinomial factor. And each, uh, I have to use each neuron for once, so ki's are all bigger than one. And then I, for each, each partition, I have to use the, the countess uh, permutations. 
And this can be written in another way. So that is, um, so basically this is a Stirling number of the second kind. And that um, counts the number of functions from a set of n elements to another set of m elements, a set of surjective functions. Right? But once there is the, surject, uh, once there's the function that maps, uh, then there's the coloring, because each n neurons were, were different to start with. So that's, uh, that brings us another n factorial. Um, and there's the second invariance that we uh, looked at. So I want to also get the scaling law for this uh, function to preserve the function. And that is uh, denoted by this number t. Um, and here, like, I'm, so n was free in the first case because from any underparameterized network, I can map into a, a wider neural network. It's going to give a, a different number. But for, I want to consider the zero loss configurations. I want to count the number of ground states. So that's why I'm fixing k. So that was the d d data generating bit. And uh, in the, now in the overparameterized network with, with m, uh, what is the number of manifolds? So this is the number of manifolds that I got, get from neuron splitting only. That is denoted by this factor g. And then there is an additional factor because there is also the zero neuron addition. So that gives me an extra, extra factor. OK. So I want to I wanna zoom into one of these manifolds. So this is not going to affect the cal complexity calculations, but I, I just want to show, show an example like of how uh, funky these things actually look like. Um, so uh, I, I just showed the theorem from Fikumizu, and they had this um, preserving of the critical points, but we didn't talk about the second order derivatives. So is it a local minimum, or is it a settle point? Um, uh, um, so here I'm showing. Yeah, maybe it's good to look at the example first. So here we are looking at the case when only one neuron is split it into two pieces, and there is a, a factor of mu that is free. So when I change mu, uh, for every mu there's a critical point, but I can move the mu, so that gives me a line of critical points. So I want to study second order derivatives on this line as a function of mu. Um, so Basically, with, with, a, um, with a decomposition of the Hessian, um, we can get this um, theorem on the signs of the eigenvalues of the Hessian. So I want to know the signs of the eigenvalues of the Hessian on this symmetry-induced critical point for a given mu. So that's on the left-hand side. So that's, uh, the theorem says like, you should look at the Hessian spectrum of the irreducible critical point, theta, and then you should look at this uh, new submetrix y that uh, I'm writing the formula here. comes from the Hessian decomposition. And uh, the nice thing is that this y and the factor of mu splits from each other. So I get a, fa a factor 1 minus mu times mu. And this fixed matrix y that depends on the neuron that I'm splitting. And then there is an extra 0 because uh, they are living on a line. So there is a 0 eigen eigenvalue like this is a due to the symmetry. And I want to show an example of a local minimum here in a, um, in a four neuron net network. And I'm going to split this first neuron, W1, A1, into two. Um, so I'm going to plot the minimum five eigenvalues of the Hessian as a function of mu. And here, um, I see the minimum eigenvalue is negative for negative mu. So on the negative, on the negative side of the line, we get strict saddles, and then in between 0 and 1, this uh, factor 1 minus mu times mu is positive. So I get a local minimum in between. And at mu 0, that uh, this, uh, the second, second part of the composition vanishes. Um, and in that case, I get only zeros. So it, it, we get a non-strict settle connecting the settles and the minimum on the line. And here is a cartoon representation of this. So here we see the, like the red part shows the local minimum. And this is, the, this is what happened in this um, actual example that I showed, uh, plotted here with the teacher-student uh, cartoon. But it could have also been like if y is a negative definite matrix, then we would get like in the, in the line rays, we would get rays of local minimum. And because there is permutation symmetry, the line is symmetric uh, from mu 0.5. So and then in between, we get the line segment of strict settles. And they are, but in any case, like independent of what is the spectrum of y, 
because this uh, middle factor vanishes at mu equals zero and one, we, it's always connected with non-strict saddles. Um, so now I want to introduce the um, landscape complexity analysis, and I'm going to kind of forget like the second order derivatives, and I'm just going to treat them all equally, and I'm going to focus on the number. Um, um, so we've looked at this first scaling law um, that came from neuron spiffing. So this is the number of um, critical manifolds. Uh, okay. So yeah, um, I want to I want to look at this number in some limits to get some idea about how it works. So um, and we are studying the loss landscape of the width m neural network. Right. So now if I take the large m limit, so I'm in an infinitely wide neural network. Um, so what is the number of manifolds coming from super small neural networks? So for small n, uh, this expansion factor is uh, exponential in m. So it grows as n to the power m. And if we look at the, and this is high loss manifolds uh, in the sense that the small network can only um, solve the data, data set to some extent. So it's gonna achieve high loss configurations. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, after the neuron spitting, the function is exactly the same. So, um, so the, I mean, the network is identical to a narrower neural network in that sense. So it achieves a high loss uh, values. And, uh, but if n is close to m, so we get this low loss manifolds. And in that, in that case, the, number, the scaling number is factorial in m. So it's, uh, it's faster than the exponential. So there are more low loss manifolds in that sense. And uh, okay, a better, better way to study these numbers is actually when, when we scale both n and m at the same speed with a factor of alpha. Um, and I'm normalizing with m to the power m in the log scale. Um, so it's similar to the low loss, uh, scaling of the low loss manifolds. And here we see a unimodal, um, unimodal distribution. So the, the more, uh, more um, common um, manifolds are the ones that come from this intermediate stage of a shrinkage factor, like alpha. And actually, uh, yeah, so this, this numbers were, uh, as I was kind of hinting, they were studied in the context of combinatorics as we realized uh, more lately. So it is, um, this G factor is equal to the number of surjections from a set of size N to another set of M. And the, also they were interested, like, where is the peak of this unimodal distribution? And uh, so it's in this um, cool math overflow discussion. And they are like, oh, it's, it, it, it is achieved at one over two log two. And that's also what we see in our cartoon. So the most, uh, most dominant critical manifolds are those coming from the neural network uh, that is one over two log two times smaller than the landscape we are analyzing. So it's, it is kind of, uh, yeah. Um, Okay, I wanna, or maybe, yeah, I wanna, yeah, let's, let's do this slide first, then I can ask for questions. So I wanna also introduce the landscape complexity measure. Um, so that is, um, so, yeah, that I'm denoting by C. So we take a teacher of network with K, and we are studying now the overparameterized network of with M. So I'm defining this as the number of critical manifolds that come from um, the network with, with K minus one. So that's the scaling law G. And then there's a scaling of the number of zero loss manifolds. That's the scaling law of T. And I wanna compare like which one scales faster. So if, the, there's, if there are too many settled manifolds, then I'm gonna conclude this is, this is a very non-convex loss landscape. So it's hard to reach zero loss manifolds. But if there are like too, too many zero loss manifolds, then I, okay, this is still a non-convex loss landscape because there are still all the settled manifolds that are exponentially growing, at least exponential or maybe factorial. But, um, there is much more zero loss manifolds, so it's a benign uh, non-convexity. Non so I wanna study how this loss land, uh, landscape complexity grows as a function of M. Um, so yeah, similar to the uh, limits that we did before, so when M goes to infinity, in the infinite width limit, it goes down to zero, so this is nice. Infinite width uh, loss landscape is uh, also benign from this point of view, so there is an um, uh, yeah, incredible amount of zero loss manifolds and the number of settles are small com in uh, comparison. So, and there's a second limit that is, uh, I think it, it's interesting. So it's the infinite data complexity limit. When the teacher width goes to infinity, 
uh, and we have limited over parameterization, so M grows in the same uh, speed, and complexity explodes. So in this regime, it should be very hard to train the neural network. Uh, so here also I'm uh, not only in the limits, but we see the complexity grows gradually. So this is, uh, so the over parameterization gradually like uh, decreases the complexity. Um, okay, here I have some toy examples. And I, I wanna talk about the deep case actually. So I, I've been discussing the shallow case only so far, but we only use the permutation symmetry to make these um, scaling low computations. And in the case of deep networks, we can apply permutation symmetry in every hidden layer. So then it will give an exponential factor on the landscape complexity. So we apply it one after the other layer, basically. Um, so it, it, that means like in the, in the mild over parameterization case, when the complexity is high, so if, it's, if the network is also deep, like it's gonna be even higher. So, uh, and we see it here, like um, in the mild over parameterization case, the gradient flow doesn't find any solutions. So the permutation symmetry like prevents it's from converging, like it's if, yeah, in, a, in, in rough terms basically. But if we over parameterize further, again, the number of zero loss manifolds take over. And I mean, if when the complexity is smaller than one, exponentiating it is gonna make it just much smaller. So it's much more easier, like in the, in the vast over parameterization. So deep depth just makes, a, makes it much difference, much more pronounced between my land vest over parameterization. And uh, so here I have an MNIST experiment. Uh, it's, we created a teacher network from the Amnist with 13 neurons, and this was funny to see. I mean, we trained it with Adam, I think, and we um, trained over parameterized networks of uh, 50 seats each, and we see like in this onset of over parameterization, it's a non-convex problem, so it doesn't converge, and then there is this uh, intermediate regime where the complexity is closer to one, and it flattens out, and it comes from the splattening of the expansion factor G uh, at the one over two log two, so there's this intermediate phase, and there, like, there's only a fraction, fraction of seats converging. And uh, with further over parameterization, okay, it's, uh, it's converging. Uh, more seats are converging towards zero loss. So this, I, I don't, I, I don't want to make a lot of claims from this uh, figure, but it was, uh, there is a little bit of parallel between the, this and the complexity plot. And from the level of analysis, like I didn't expect to see like any match between these two, maybe. So it was it was surprising that there are some there is a, maybe uh, some some indications that the complexity analysis gives us on the training dynamics. Um, so in the, in the, uh, in the, in for very wide neural networks, do you mean? Yeah, I guess in this. Yeah, so this, uh, we can look at actually this uh, unimodal curve, sorry. It's actually the switch comes from really, I'm going in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. Yep. Um, so what happens for, yeah, let's do it like this. What happens for wide neural networks is, um, so whatever k is, k is gonna be like a small compared to m, let's say. And this is, uh, the t, t is always larger than g because there's the, due to the zero, um, zero neurons. So let's say, let's even forget the zero neurons, let's consider only g. Um, and the, I mean the ratio is g basically k minus one m. Right? So that is uh, the k minus one factor is gonna be lower than the k factor because it's increasing, the g function is increasing in this case. And why it flips in the vest over parameterization is because when k is large, uh, close to m, then the settled manifolds are larger than the zero so loss that manifolds. that transition has to do with this thing being uniform. Exactly, yeah. And it's, it's an a- infinite width corresponds to the left side of the curve. Exactly, yeah, that's the right way to read it. Uh, for, for choosing the parameters of the teacher. Yeah, I'm wondering basically if the, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand, like, 
Oh, I see. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So I, so yeah, it's a, so for, for sure. Like I know some teachers that are not gonna like be difficult in the sense that even with zero over parameterization, you can learn these teachers. Like the teachers infinitely wide, depending on the selection of the parameters. So for, if you choose a unit orthonormal teacher with odd activation functions, like this is a. So if you sample them, like if d is larger than the k, right? They are gonna be like the first layer is gonna be orthogonal to each other. So that's going to be effectively a unit orthonormal teacher. So this, this teacher is easy to train. So I mean, this, uh, this, uh, this, ar my argument is going to fail, actually. But I think this is an extra simple case. Uh, and it's not like a teacher fitted to MNIST, like where each neuron has to do something different, like learn a different component of the data set. So we are trying to construct like more like, um, like um, um, less random teachers in some sense. Like this is by choosing the hyperplanes, for example. And uh, creating like this XOR constellations, it's it's a bit the idea. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, we didn't do this. So I want to go back to the questions that I was hinting at the beginning of the talk. So I was, um, yeah, why why is it hard to train without over parameterization? So that is uh, because. They are, are, yeah, I argue that it's a, a, extremely long convexity, but I want to say like this is a this is not true for all the teachers, but for average case teachers, I think this is a good picture to keep in mind. And here I'm uh, plotting a cartoon, like that's um, so the um, the x the y the yeah the ver vertical axis is the loss of the critical manifolds, and this first circle is the critical manifolds coming from small neural networks. So the g the Expansion factor G is small, and as we increase the width of the underparameterized network, there's more uh, number of critical manifolds. So, and we are going uh, lower in the loss levels. After uh, one over two, a factor of one over two log two, where there is this like most numerous, uh, this is the most numerous uh, critical manifolds at this loss level, and then if we go further overparameterized or further down in the loss level. Um, there, is a, there is a smaller number of manifolds, and we eventually hit the zero loss uh, part of the loss landscape. Um, so this is, this is the case of a zero overparameterization. But now if you overparameterize the neural network, this loss landscape, the, the global structure of it changes, uh, because uh, what happens is that we don't fall onto the second phase of the unimodal curve that we looked at before. So we are on the onset of, uh, of that curve. And the, the settle, settle manifolds like grow gradually uh, as we decrease the loss level. And the zero loss manifold is the no, most numerous. And uh, so it's uh, kind of, it's easier to converge in some sense. So this is a, I, I don't know if this picture makes sense, but uh, yeah, it's, yeah, uh, maybe we can't take it offline. If someone is interested, I'm, I would be very happy to talk about them. It's, uh, and uh, the question also like, that I hinted at the beginning, like how much over parameterization do we need in average case problems? So this, uh, this complex analysis gives at least two log two, and in the cartoons practical scenarios that I showed at first, it, was, like, it looked like a factor of four, but uh, yeah, I have no ways to like, make a strong claim on this. Like, I think yeah, one should choose a problem and just um, yeah, focus on, it. yeah, it's a very problem specific, but it's, it's nice that it gives a kind of an average case analysis like with, with this analysis. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the equivalence class of global minimum. Um, so here I'm assuming some more assumptions. Uh, the, the input distribution has full support, and the, the teacher network is unique up to permutation. So there is only one function that interpolates the data set. And then I'm assuming that the activation function is analytic, doesn't cross zero, it's zero, and it's, uh, it has non-zero derivatives for infinitely many odd and even uh, values. So it, it is to say it can't be an odd activation function or it can't be an even activation function because then I would have to add like more symmetries like the mirror symmetry uh, in my neuron addition uh, catalog. So I want to study the simplest, uh, simplest symmetry scenario. And in this case we get that the all zero loss uh, points in an overparameterized network are identical to the teacher network up to neuron splitting and zero neuron addition. So if you have a zero loss point, 
it has to be identical to the teacher up to these two symmetries. So this is the ground state of the over neural network. And I want to study the topology of this uh, manifold. So I want to, yeah, let's look at the toy case with the two teacher student neurons and three student neurons. So the factor T re returns 12. And in this case, um, each dot represents an affine subspace of zero loss points, and they are connected to one another. Um, if, they are, if the two affine subspaces are, have an intersection, I put an edge between them. So that gives me the connectivity graph of the global minimum manifold. Um, and then um, I, I can plot it in another case with three teacher neurons and four student neurons. So it's a 60 affine subspaces. Um, so that are all, I mean, and green and blue type of affine subspaces are different because the blue one has um, a neuron that is split it and the green one has an extra neuron that is a zero neuron. So with the zero neuron, I can move the parameter to the splitted neuron. And then from the spitted neuron, I can move one of the spitted, the other spitted neuron to another zero neuron. So that's how we walk towards like within inside uh, this global minimum manifold. Okay, so maybe. Um, uh, any questions? Uh, then I'm going to talk about this uh, pruning application. So here is a cartoon of uh, what I was uh, talking, uh, describing before. Like it's uh, with zero over parameterization, we have a non-convex optimization loss landscape. And it's not only non-convex, non but it's also hard to train. So it's not like a um, benign non-convexity in the sense that all settles are strict and we can still converge to the global minimum manifold. So we have non-strict settles, we have degenerate settles on the line of critical points. So. Um, and then the way to solve this, one way to solve this optimization problem is to go to an overparameterized neural network with a factor of rho, and then uh, train a bunch of seeds, and then collect the neurons of all these seeds together, and just uh, cluster them together. And this is a, this is in this um, in Flavio's paper we put it on archive recently, um, and here we have again like the examples that I showed similar to the first slide. So we are creating some teacher networks that has input dimension eight. First layer with four, and the second layer with two. And then this is a, oh yeah. If we, if we train this teacher network, we reach like high loss levels. But if you train an over um student networks, as expected, we, each, we reach lower loss levels for different seeds. But if we looked at the neurons of these networks and combined them together using this, uh, I mean, kicking out the zero neurons and then merging together the spitted neurons together, we go back to the uh, shallower neural network because we are cutting, uh, not shallower, narrower neural network because we are cutting of some neurons and it actually achieves much better loss because we are also removing the noise from the neurons that comes from training. Um, so this uh, works in some settings, in, in some toy settings that I'm showing here and in an MNIST setting too. And uh, so here I have like, uh, I'm showing more experiments uh, in line with Sebastian's question. So here like we have teacher networks generated by this uh, XOR like hyperplane configurations. And we see like, so this is factor two of over and so on. So as the larger the over factor is, the general trend is uh, that it gets easier to, easier to converge. But it's also like, to, it's, it, yeah, it's hard to like analyze these questions more in finer detail because but it doesn't even converge for every seed, even at a factor of four. So we see some like green dots. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, just to summarize. Thank you. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Delete that at this. Okay. You know, it's always convenient to go more of a parameterized, okay? I don't know which architecture you are using here, okay? But, you know, if I delete this block, and of course I delete this block, okay? Because these are relationships, but 
Let's say uh, why you are not social democratic in the end of the story. Is it the best uh, bestseller you are in general also with a with a listing of good books, uh, you know? Mm. So your the best plot is basically telling you that you know teacher learning uh, will finance this method is not good. I I, I, uh, yeah. I mean it's not I yeah, 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 yeah. it's like you know your opinion but it's also yeah. something yeah, it's, it's a great question, actually. I, I mean, a, a, another way to, so I didn't make this plots first, I took them from these papers. Uh, but um, yeah, so ex in, in these plots, yeah, infinitely wide networks are working better, but you don't want to train an infinitely wide network in practice. What? It's it, you, you don't want to train an infinitely wide I mean, neural network. You don't need to train, you just don't make an experiment to try to see what happens if you try it. That, that's the uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure if, these, uh, if this solution is exactly like identical to the anti-case solution, actually, because even in infinitely wide network, you know, there's the, like, a, if you scale your parameters large, then you converge to the anti-case solution, anti-k plus n and gp solution. But if, you, if your parameters are slow, then we don't know, have a closed form expression for the function. So we don't know, like, we have to train the infinitely wide neural network to get uh, the small, initial, small initialization solution in the mean field regime. So that's the first thing. And um, the, so yeah, it's an interesting question, like how the anti-k solution would uh, fall onto this term, but uh, on, on this curve. I think for feed the forward neural networks, um, Francesco Spaz and Metivia and their group has a lot of work on showing like the anti-k solutions are better than the mean field solutions, but for convolutional networks, it's the other way around. So I, I don't think by any means it's the end of the story, actually. No. Um, but, uh, and also like, so yeah, the, uh, then the then yeah, when, when you don't have this closed form correspondence through the anti-k, like let's say you want to recover the mean field solution in some ways, then the question is like, what is the network that you want to train? Like, should it be a super wide network or like with a factor of ten, you already converge to that solution like effectively? And that's uh, so I, I I find it interesting that this curve like plateaus, so uh, you could go to this like the beginning like of the, where, where you're starting to converge to this solution. And I think like the other picture would be like that this curve decreases smoothly. So it would be the variance reduction picture like what we get from the anti-k analysis. But it's, it's actually I picked these kind of pictures like to be honest with you because there are like other pictures that show exactly the same experiments and this curve like decays slowly and that's uh, compatible with the anti-k point of view. But um, I mean this, the, these things also came from uh, that line of work. So I was like okay. And it fits my fit my story, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's true, right? It's all about how you go to the infinite wide network experiment, right? You can go to it in the non non anti k way, and then you end up with closed forms, or you go to it in the mean field way, and then you have to learn two k solutions. It's a lot of gray there. So it's like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this. Uh, honestly, like with my with my symmetry arguments, I uh, like it has zero sensitivity to like the training, the scaling of the tra training data set. I mean, in Reza's uh, pl uh, um, slides, we saw that the like he had this nice picture with the ERM landscape. Like it is more funkier than the population loss landscape, and I, I think it it is it looks like that. Um, so it's and I mean to study like how this. Uh, how the, the critical points disappear with like the as the sample complexity increases, and how, how how many new ones that you get like in the finite sample scenarios. I think that's I have no way to do it with this with this approach. So. Um, Okay, yeah, this, uh, yeah. Uh, 
uh, if I have finite, uh, if I have a finite training data set, yes. uh, then it it should be kind of effectively like uh, it it should have converged to the population loss. This I agree. But to study the scaling of it, like it's I think it's a very like uh, I wouldn't know. I mean, yeah, it's a difficult one. The horizontal line. The vertical line. Uh, the vertical line. It, it is it represents the first time it hits the zero, zero training area. So it would be my k, the width of the teacher network. Um. Good question. So, uh, I mean, there is a little bit of peak here. A little bit of peak here. <laughs> no, it's a, maybe there's early stopping. That's a, that could be one thing. Uh, early stopping could be any kind of regularization. Could be no additional noise in the label. And then it starts to peak. Hmm. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. Last question. It's um, I mean, so one thing for sure is I'm only using the symmetries to make all the arguments, and it's um, it's, but I'm also using the network parameterization because this neuron splitting is a special symmetry to neural networks. If I didn't have a second layer, if the second layer was fixed, for example, it would be still permutation symmetric, but I wouldn't have the neuron splitting invariance. So, uh, so it's not even only only permutation symmetry. I think it's a really neural network thing uh, that I'm analyzing, uh, the counting here. But it's also true, like in a lot of physics problems, there's lots of symmetries. So, there's the well, with rotation symmetry, actually, things. Uh, okay, what what I can say for linear neural networks. Um, in that case, uh, when there's no activation function, like this manifolds merge together uh, with the rotational symmetry. So there is, it's a more like thick, big one or two manifolds, and I lose all the numbers. So with the rotational, it's, it's more like, yeah, it's, uh, I think I would lose the, these uh, um, scaling arguments. Yeah. But uh, it's, we can talk more, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, I would say let's uh, finish the usage part of the Q&A. Yeah, let's take again our speakers from this morning.